Part Five of the Astral Plane by C. W. Ledbetter. Inhabitants continued. Three artificial. This, the largest class of astral entities, is also much the most important to man. Being entirely his own creation, it is interrelated with him by the closest karmic bonds, and its action upon him is direct and incessant. It is an enormous inchoate mass of semi-intelligent entities, differing among themselves, as human thoughts differ, and practically incapable of anything like classification or arrangement. The only division which can usefully be made is that which distinguishes between the artificial elementals made by the majority of mankind unconsciously and those made by magicians with definite intent. While we may relegate to a third class the very small number of artificially arranged entities which are not elementals at all. 1. Elementals formed unconsciously. It has already been explained that the elemental essence which surrounds us on every side is in all its numberless varieties singularly susceptible to the influence of human thought. The action of the mere casual wandering thought upon it, causing it to burst into a cloud of rapidly moving evanescent forms, has already been described. We have now to note how it is affected when the human mind formulates a definite purposeful thought or wish. The effect produced is of the most striking nature. The thought seizes upon the plastic essence and moulds it instantly into a living being of appropriate form a being which when once thus created is in no way under the control of its creator but lives out a life of its own the length of which is proportionate to the intensity of the thought or wish which called it into existence it lasts in fact just as long as the thought force holds it together most people's thoughts are so fleeting and indecisive that the elementals created by them last only a few minutes or a few hours but an oft-repeated thought or an earnest wish will form an elemental whose existence may extend to many days since the ordinary man's thoughts refer very largely to himself the elementals they form remain hovering about him and constantly tend to provoke a repetition of the idea they represent instead of forming new elementals would strengthen the old one and give it a fresh lease of life a man, therefore, who frequently dwells upon one wish, often forms for himself an astral attendant, which, constantly fed by fresh thought, may haunt him for years, ever gaining more and more strength and influence over him, and it will easily be seen that if the desire be an evil one, the effect upon his moral nature may be of the most disastrous character. Still more pregnant of results for good or evil are man's thoughts about other people, for in that case they hover not about the thinker but about the object of the thought a kindly thought about any person or an earnest wish for his good will form and project towards him a friendly artificial elemental if the wish be a definite one as for example that he may recover from some sickness then the elemental will be a force ever hovering over him to promote his recovery or to ward off any influence that might tend to hinder it and in doing this it will display what appears like a very considerable amount of intelligence and adaptability, though really it is simply a force acting along the line of least resistance, pressing steadily in one direction all the time, and taking advantage of any channel that it can find, just as the water in a cistern would in a moment find the one open pipe among a dozen closed ones, and proceed to empty itself through that if the wish be merely an indefinite one for his general good the elemental essence in its wonderful plasticity will respond exactly to that less distinct idea also and the creature formed will expend its force in the direction of whatever action for the man's advantage comes most readily to hand of course in all cases the amount of such force it has to expend and the length of time that it will live to expend it depend entirely upon the strength of the original wish or thought which gave it birth. Though it must be remembered that it can be, as it were, fed and strengthened, and its life period protracted by other good wishes or friendly thoughts projected in the same direction. Furthermore, it appears to be actuated, 
like most other beings, by an instinctive desire to prolong its life, and thus reacts on its creator as a force constantly tending to provoke the renewal of the feeling which called it into existence. It also influences, in a similar manner, others with whom it comes into contact, though its rapport with them is naturally not so perfect. All that has been said as to the effects of good wishes and friendly thoughts is also true in the opposite direction of evil wishes and angry thoughts, and considering the amount of envy, hatred, malice, and all uncharitableness that exists in the world, it will be readily understood that among the artificial elementals many terrible creatures are to be seen. A man whose thoughts or desires are spiteful, brutal, sensual, avaricious, moves through the world, carrying with him everywhere a pestiferous atmosphere of his own, peopled with the loathsome beings he has created to be his companions and thus is not only in sadly evil case himself, but is a dangerous nuisance to his fellow men, subjecting all who have the misfortune to come into contact with him to the risk of moral contagion from the influence of the abominations with which he chooses to surround himself. A feeling of envious or jealous hatred towards another person will send an evil elemental to hover over him and seek for a weak point through which it can operate and if the feeling be a persistent one, such a creature may be continually nourished by it, and thereby enabled to protract its undesirable activity for a very long period. It can, however, produce no effect upon the person towards whom it is directed, unless he has himself some tendency which it can foster, some fulcrum for its lever, as it were. From the aura of a man of pure thought and good life, all such influences at once rebound finding nothing upon which they can fasten, and in that case, by a very curious law, they react in all their force upon their original creator. In him, by the hypothesis, they find a very congenial sphere of action, and thus the karma of his evil wish works itself out at once by means of the very entity which he himself has called into existence. It occasionally happens, however, that an artificial elemental of this description is for various reasons unable to expend its force either upon its object or its creator, and in such cases it becomes a kind of wandering demon, readily attracted by any person who indulges feelings similar to that which gave it birth, and equally prepared either to stimulate such feelings in him for the sake of the strength it may gain for them, or to pour out its store of evil influence upon him through any opening which he may offer it. If it is sufficiently powerful to seize upon and inhabit some passing shell, it frequently does so, as the possession of such a temporary home enables it to husband its dreadful resources more carefully. In this form, it may manifest through a medium, and by masquerading as some well-known friend, may sometimes obtain an influence over people upon whom it would otherwise have little hold. What has been written above will serve to enforce the statement already made as to the importance of maintaining a strict control over our thoughts. Many a well-meaning man who is scrupulously careful to do his duty towards his neighbour in word and deed is apt to consider that his thoughts at least are nobody's business but his own, and so lets them run riot in various directions, utterly unconscious of the swarms of baleful creatures he is launching upon the world. To such a man an accurate comprehension of the effect of thought and desire in producing artificial elementals would come as a horrifying revelation. On the other hand, it would be the greatest consolation to many devoted and grateful souls who are oppressed with the feeling that they are unable to do anything in return for the kindness lavished upon them by their benefactors. For friendly thoughts and earnest good wishes are as easily and as effectually formulated by the poorest as by the richest and it is within the power of almost any man, if he will take the trouble, to maintain what is practically a good angel always at the side of the brother or sister, the friend or the child whom he loves best, no matter in what part of the world he may be. Many a time a mother's loving thoughts and prayers have formed themselves into an angel guardian for the child, and except in the almost impossible case that the child had in him no instinctive response to a good influence, have undoubtedly given him assistance and protection. Such guardians may often be seen by clairvoyant vision, 
and there have even been cases where one of them has had sufficient strength to materialize and become for the moment visible to physical sight a curious fact which deserves mention here is that even after the passage of the mother into the devachanic condition the love which she pours out upon the children she thinks of as surrounding her will react upon the real children still living in this world and will often support the guardian elemental which she created while on earth until her dear ones themselves pass away in turn as madame blavatsky remarks her love will always be felt by the children in the flesh it will manifest in their dreams and often in various events in providential protections and escapes for love is a strong shield and is not limited by space or time key to theosophy page one hundred and fifty all the stories of the intervention of guardian angels must not however be attributed to the action of artificial elementals for in many cases such angels have been the souls of either living or recently departed human beings and they have also occasionally though rarely been devas this power of an earnest desire especially if frequently repeated to create an active elemental which ever presses forcefully in the direction of its own fulfilment is the scientific explanation of what devout but unphilosophical people describe as answers to prayer there are occasions though at present these are rare when the karma of the person so praying is such as to permit of assistance being directly rendered to him by an adept or his pupil and there is also the still rarer possibility of the intervention of a deva or some friendly nature spirit but in all these cases the easiest and most obvious form for such assistance to take would be the strengthening and the intelligent direction of the elemental already formed by the wish a very curious and instructive instance of the extreme persistence of these artificial elementals under favourable circumstances came under the notice of one of our investigators quite recently all readers of the literature of such subjects are aware that many of our ancient families are supposed to have associated with them a traditional death warning a phenomenon of one kind or another which foretells usually some days beforehand the approaching decease of the head of the house a picturesque example of this is the well-known story of the white bird of the oxenums whose appearance has ever since the time of queen elizabeth been recognised as a sure presage of the death of some member of the family while another is the spectral coach which is reported to drive up to the door of a certain castle in the north when a similar calamity is impending a phenomenon of this order occurs in connection with the family of one of our members but it is of a much commoner and less striking type than either of the above consisting only of a solemn and impressive strain of dirge-like music which is heard apparently floating in the air three days before the death takes place our member having himself twice heard this mystic sound finding its warning in both cases quite accurate and knowing also that according to family tradition the same thing had been happening for several centuries set himself to seek by occult methods for the cause underlying so strange a phenomenon the result was unexpected but interesting it appeared that somewhere in the twelfth century the head of the family went to the crusades like many another valiant man and took with him to win his spurs in the sacred cause his youngest and favourite son a promising youth whose success in life was the dearest wish of his father's heart unhappily however the young man was killed in battle and the father was plunged into the depths of despair lamenting not only the loss of his son but still more the fact that he was cut off so suddenly in the full flush of careless and not altogether blameless youth so poignant indeed were the old man's feelings that he cast off his knightly armour and joined one of the great monastic orders vowing to devote all the remainder of his life to prayer first for the soul of his son and secondly that henceforward no descendant of his might ever again encounter what seemed to his simple and pious mind the terrible danger of meeting death unprepared day after day for many a year he poured all the energy of his soul into the channel of that one intense wish firmly believing that somehow or other the result he so earnestly desired would be brought about 
a student of occultism will have little difficulty in deciding what would be the effect of such a definite and long-continued stream of thought our knightly monk created an artificial elemental of immense power and resourcefulness for its own particular object and accumulated within it a store of force which would enable it to carry out his wishes for an indefinite period an elemental is a perfect storage battery one from which there is practically no leakage and when we remember what its original strength must have been and how comparatively rarely it would be called upon to put it forth we shall scarcely wonder that even now it exhibits unimpaired vitality and still warns the direct descendants of the old crusader of their approaching doom by repeating in their ears the strange wailing music which was the dirge of a young and valiant soldier seven hundred years ago in palestine two elementals formed consciously since such results as have been described above have been achieved by the thought force of men who were entirely in the dark as to what they were doing it will readily be imagined that a magician who understands the subject and can see exactly what effect he is producing may wield immense power along these lines as a matter of fact occultists of both the white and dark schools frequently use artificial elementals in their work and few tasks are beyond the powers of such creatures when scientifically prepared and directed with knowledge and skill for one who knows how to do so can maintain a connection with his elemental and guide it no matter at what distance it may be working so that it will practically act as though endowed with the full intelligence of its master very definite and very efficient guardian angels have sometimes been supplied in this way though it is probably very rarely that carina permits such a decided interference in a person's life as that would be in such a case however as that of a pupil of the adepts who might have in the course of his work for them to run the risk of attack from forces with which his unaided strength would be entirely insufficient to cope guardians of this description have been given and have fully provided their sleepless vigilance and their tremendous power by some of the more advanced processes of black magic also artificial elementals of great power may be called into existence and much evil has been worked in various ways by such entities but it is true of them as of the previous class that if they are aimed at a person whom by reason of his purity of character they are unable to influence they react with terrible force upon their creator so that the medieval story of the magician being torn to pieces by the fiends he himself had raised is no mere fable but may well have an awful foundation in fact such creatures occasionally for various reasons escape from the control of those who are trying to make use of them and become wandering and aimless demons as do some of those mentioned under the previous heading under similar circumstances but those that we are considering having much more intelligence and power and a much longer existence are proportionately more dangerous they invariably seek for means of prolonging their life either by feeding like vampires upon the vitality of human beings or by influencing them to make offerings to them and among simple half-savage tribes they have frequently succeeded by judicious management in getting themselves recognized as village or family gods any deity which demands sacrifices involving the shedding of blood may always be set down as belonging to the lowest and most loathsome class of this order other less objectionable types are sometimes content with offerings of rice and cooked food of various kinds there are parts of india where both these varieties may be found flourishing even at the present day and in africa they are probably comparatively numerous by means of whatever nourishment they can obtain from the offerings and still more by the vitality they draw from their devotees they may continue to prolong their existence for many years or even centuries retaining sufficient strength to perform occasional phenomena of a mild type in order to stimulate the faith and zeal of their followers and invariably making themselves unpleasant in some way or other if the accustomed sacrifices are neglected for example it was asserted recently that in one indian village the inhabitants had found that whenever for any reason the local deity did not get his or her regular meals 
spontaneous fires began to break out with alarming frequency among the cottages sometimes three or four simultaneously in cases where they declared it was impossible to suspect human agency and other stories of a more or less similar nature will no doubt recur to the memory of any reader who knows something of the out-of-the-way corners of that most wonderful of all countries the art of manufacturing artificial elementals of extreme virulence and power seems to have been one of the specialities of the magicians of atlantis the lords of the dark face one example of their capabilities in this line is given in the secret doctrine volume two page four hundred and twenty seven where we read of the wonderful speaking animals who had to be quieted by an offering of blood lest they should awaken their masters and warn them of the impending destruction but apart from these strange beasts they created other artificial entities of power and energy so tremendous that it is darkly hinted that some of them have kept themselves in existence even to this day though it is more than eleven thousand years since the cataclysm which overwhelmed their original masters the terrible indian goddess whose devotees were impelled to commit in her name the awful crimes of thuggi the ghastly kali worshipped even to this day with rites too abominable to be described might well be a relic of a system which had to be swept away even at the cost of the submergence of a continent and the loss of sixty-five million human lives three human artificials we have now to consider a class of entities which though it contains but very few individuals has acquired from its intimate connection with one of the great movements of modern times an importance entirely out of proportion to its numbers it seems doubtful whether it should appear under the first or third of our main divisions but though certainly human it is so far removed from the course of ordinary evolution so entirely the product of a will outside of its own that it perhaps falls most naturally into place among the artificial beings the easiest way of describing it will be to commence with its history and to do that we must once more look back to the great atlantean race in thinking of the adepts and schools of occultism of that remarkable people our minds instinctively revert to the evil practices of which we hear so much in connection with their latter days but we must not forget that before that age of selfishness and degradation the mighty civilization of atlantis had brought forth much that was noble and worthy of admiration and that among its leaders were some who now stand upon the loftiest pinnacles as yet attained by man among the lodges for occult study preliminary to initiation formed by the adepts of the good law was one in a certain part of america which was then tributary to one of the great atlantean monarchs the divine rulers of the golden gate and though it has passed through many and strange vicissitudes though it has had to move its headquarters from country to country as each in turn was invaded by the jarring elements of a later civilization that lodge still exists even at the present day observing still the same old world ritual even teaching as a sacred and hidden language the same atlantean tongue which was used as its foundation so many thousands of years ago it still remains what it was from the first a lodge of occultists of pure and philanthropic aims which can lead those students whom it finds worthy no inconsiderable distance on the road to knowledge and confers such psychic powers as are in its gift only after the most searching tests as to the fitness of the candidate its teachers do not stand upon the adept level yet hundreds have learned through it how to set their feet upon the path which has led them to adeptship in later lives and though it is not in direct communication with the brotherhood of the himalayas there are some among the latter who have themselves been connected with it in former incarnations and therefore retain a more than ordinarily friendly interest in its proceedings the chiefs of this lodge though they have always kept themselves and their society strictly in the background have nevertheless done what they could from time to time to assist the progress of truth in the world and some half century ago in despair at the rampant materialism which seemed to be stifling all spirituality in europe and america they determined to make an attempt to combat it by somewhat novel methods in point of fact 
to offer opportunities by which any reasonable man could acquire absolute proof of that life apart from the physical body which it was the tendency of science to deny the phenomena exhibited were not in themselves absolutely new since in some form or other we may hear of them all through history but their definite organization their production as it were to order these were features distinctly new to the modern world the movement they thus set on foot gradually grew into the vast fabric of modern spiritualism and though it would perhaps be unfair to hold the originators of the scheme directly responsible for many of the results which have followed we must admit that they have achieved their purpose to the extent of converting vast numbers of people from a belief in nothing in particular to a firm faith in at any rate some kind of future life this is undoubtedly a magnificent result though in the opinion of many of those whose power and knowledge enable them to take a wider view of such matters than we can it has been attained at too great a cost since it seems to them that on the whole the harm done outweighs the good the method adopted was to take some ordinary person after death arouse him thoroughly upon the astral plane instruct him to a certain extent in the powers and possibilities belonging to it and then put him in charge of a spiritualistic circle he in his turn developed other departed personalities along the same line they all acted upon those who sat at their seances and developed them as mediums and so spiritualism grew and flourished no doubt living members of the original lodge occasionally manifested themselves in astral form at some of the circles perhaps they may do so even now but in most cases they simply gave such direction and guidance as they considered necessary to the persons they had put in charge there is little doubt that the movement increased so much more rapidly than they had expected that it soon got quite beyond their control so that as has been said for many of the later developments they can only be held indirectly responsible of course the intensification of the astral plane life in those persons who were thus put in charge of circles distinctly delayed their natural progress and though the idea had been that anything lost in this way would be fully atoned for by the good karma gained by helping to lead others to the truth it was soon found that it was impossible to make use of a spirit guide for any length of time without doing him serious and permanent injury in some cases such guides were therefore withdrawn and others substituted for them in others it was considered for various reasons undesirable to make such a change and then a very remarkable expedient was adopted which gave rise to the curious class of creatures we have called human artificials the higher principles of the original guide were allowed to pass on their long delayed evolution into the devachanic condition but the shade he left behind him was taken possession of sustained and operated upon so that it might appear to its admiring circle practically just as before this seems at first to have been done by members of the lodge themselves but apparently that arrangement was found irksome or unsuitable or perhaps was considered a waste of force and the same objection applied to the use for this purpose of an artificial elemental so it was eventually decided that the departed person who would have been appointed to succeed the late spirit guide should still do so but should take possession of the latter's shade or shell and in fact simply wear his appearance it is said that some members of the lodge objected to this on the ground that though the purpose might be entirely good a certain amount of deception was involved but the general opinion seems to have been that as the shade really was the same and contained something at any rate of the original lower manus there was nothing that could be called deception in the matter this then was the genesis of the human artificial entity and it is understood that in some cases more than one such change has been made without arousing suspicion though on the other hand some investigators of spiritualism have remarked on the fact that after a considerable lapse of time certain differences suddenly became observable in the manner and disposition of a spirit it is needless to say that none of the adept brotherhood has ever approved of the formation of an artificial entity of this sort though they could not interfere with any one who thought it right to take such a course a weak point in the arrangement is that many others besides the original lodge may adopt this plan 
and there is nothing whatever to prevent black magicians from supplying communicating spirits as indeed they have been known to do with this class we conclude our survey of the inhabitants of the astral plane with the reservation specially made some few pages back the catalogue may be taken as a fairly complete one but it must once more be emphasised that this treatise claims only to sketch the merest outline of a very vast subject the detailed elaboration of which would need a lifetime of study and hard work end of part five